Um, I'm David Abrahams. I'm the director of the Isaac Newton Institute here. And it's my pleasure always to introduce the, you know, the, the VIPs <laughs> to the Institute. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gert Igerenza. Um He is currently the director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy in Berlin and at the same time director of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin as well. Um, I think um, occasionally you have somebody who comes to speak whose CV is too large to mention anything in particular and uh, your CV runs to 84 pages so <laughs> I think that um, you're a large enough name for us not to, for me not to spend time spoiling your talk. Um, just to say that the Harding Center for Lit um, Risk Literacy in Berlin is really the sister institute of, of um, the center here in, um, in Cambridge, which is supported by Winton Cap Capital Management. And you may have seen David Spiegelholter around, who's um, a proponent on risk here. And so the new executive director is sitting here. OK, yeah. very good. Um, uh, Gert is a German psychologist who's an expert on the use of bounded <coughs> rationality and heuristics in decision making. And um, I don't like using Wikipedia, but they ask a question on it which says, how do humans make inference about their world with limited time and knowledge? And your answer, it says, is that in an uncertain world, probability theory is not enough. People use smart heuristics. That is rules of thumb, and I think that um, perhaps sums up a lot of your research and your mm -hmm. thinking. So um, I would just say that Gert is, uh, is known throughout the world. He's got honorary uh, degrees from many institutions, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. And I believe we've been working you very hard for your money, <laughs> um, many, many talks, and I hope it's not too much of a strain, but it's a great pleasure to have you talking today as uh, as a Rothschild lecture for us on helping doctors and patients make sense of health statistics. Thank you very much. In the 19th century, the health of the general public in the Western world was improved by clean water, better hygiene, healthy food, and enough food. That was called the first revolution in healthcare. In the 20th century, we had what's known the second revolution, uh, based on scientific discoveries and the profi professionalization of medicine. The second revolution, however, has not delivered one important thing, which is doctors and patients who understand health statistics. Efficient health care needs that doctors and patients and the rest of the professional medicine understand the modern technologies. Yet, the 20th century has focused on technology, not on understanding technology. Uh, the what I will do today, I will report about our attempts at the Harding Center for Risk Literacy at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin to improve the understanding of doctors and patients about the outcomes of technology, of tests, of treatments. And also to do something against the mass of misleading information in healthcare. And my general conclusion will be, it's often said that better health care requires either yeah, uh, that the costs go up or that the service is going down. There is a third option. The third option is better informed doctors and better informed patients can result in better health care at lower costs. In your country, you're doing part of that not necessarily in the US or in Germany. So let me start. Uh, 
here is the problem I will deal with. Most doctors and patients do not understand health statistics. That is the result of many studies we and others have done. This is a problem the public is not well aware. You go to your doctor and you trust your doctor and you think your doctor knows the relevant evidence. You may be lucky, have the right doctors, but there is no guarantee for that, as you will see in a minute. What are the causes for that problem? First, it's the failure of almost all medical schools around the world to teach statistical thinking. And I will today only talk about that part uh, in my research that deals with statistical thinking, not with heuristic thinking. That's another lecture. <laughs> and medical schools teach all kinds of things that uh, young doctors learn by heart, but they do not teach thinking. Um, <coughs> with a few exceptions, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, the second cause is biased reporting in medical journals and pamphlets. And I will give you some example how the same information can be twisted so that you have, and not only you, but doctors, believe, oh, that's a good treatment, oh, that's a bad treatment. Same information. And finally, there is lack of public education and also a political climate in several countries, including the UK and the US, where the idea is we need more paternalism rather than making people risk uh, savvy, and particular in soft paternalism is on walk, like nudging people into behavior, health behavior, that is allegedly for their benefits without educating people. My American friends who are pro-nudging have always justified that by the idea that the government is benevolent, the Obama government at least, yeah, and so it's good if people stay ignorant, but the government will do the best for them. Good luck for the next presidency. The solution uh, includes teaching risk literacy in medical school. That's not yet the case. There is biometrics being taught, or biostatistics being taught, that usually enters here in students' ear and exits immediately out on the other side because they cannot connect to what they are doing. Second, implement transparent, honest, and complete risk communication in pamphlets, in journals, and of course in the media. And finally, the most important measure is start finally teaching risk literacy in school. And as important it was at the beginning of the 20th century to teach literacy, reading and writing, to everyone, and we have achieved that. In the same way, we can achieve teaching risk literacy to everyone, if we only try. But still, today, our children are taught the mathematics of certainty and not the mathematics of uncertainty. They are taught algebra, trigonometry, geometry, beautiful systems. Most of you cannot use them anymore. Here, it's an exception. <laughs> But they don't teach uh, the mathematics of uncertainty, that is, statistical thinking. And if it's taught at the universities, it's more taught like statistical rituals and not thinking. So let me start. Are you ready? So here is the general problem in healthcare. Uh, there are three key problems. The first one is self-defense. That is, in many countries, doctors hmm, view patients as potential plaintiffs and protect themselves yeah, by ordering too many tests, drugs, surgery, in order to be on the safe side. That's called defensive medicine. In other words, it means that doctors uh, think they have no choice but recommending to you as patients 
unnecessary things, they would never recommend their own family members. This problem differs in its amount from country to country. It's particularly high in the US because of the American tort law. And in one study, over 800 physicians were asked whether they practice defensive medicine. And 93% said, yes, that's what I'm doing. And it's probably an underestimate because not everyone admits it to the other or to him or herself. The, uh, we do not have reliable estimates in Europe. Um, a study in Switzerland where I was involved showed that about 40% of Swiss doctors, not a representative sample, a convenient sample, hmm, uh, said that they advise prostate cancer early detection to their patients be because of legal reasons, not clinical reasons. So probably it's lower in the, in the So that's the self-defense aspect of the, what I call the sick problem in healthcare. The second one is in numeracy, and I will focus on this one today in the lecture. And the third ones are conflicts of interest. So uh, many um, hospitals in many countries are more driven by um, business aspects than by clinical aspects. And, the, and that creates a conflict between the doctor, between your interests and the interests of the clinic or the doctor, depending on the system. If it's fee for service, which you don't have, except I think for dentists, you need to be aware of every uh, yeah, biopsy, um, or uh, a screening test you're being advised, huh? because it may be just for making money. Hmm? And often, <coughs> the first problem, self-defense, and the third problem, conflict of interest, going the same direction. You do unnecessary tests, it increases the income, and at the same time, it protects you from the patient. For instance, uh, in the US, about 10 million women have uh, unnecessary pap smear screening for cervix cancer. Unnecessary because they have no cervix anymore. They got a complete hysterectomy. Still, the doctors recommend screening. That is just a waste of doctor's time and uh, their taxpayers' money. Uh, second example, an estimated one million American children get every year unnecessary computer tomography, so-called CT scans. That is not just a waste of money. It's also a danger for the child. So a CT scan can have, depending on what organ it's done and how often it's done, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the radiation doses in the order of 100 mammograms. So if you worry about radiation and not going to have your next vacations uh, nearby Fukushima, you actually would get a lower radiation doses than for most CT scans, just to illustrate that. Hmm? And these three problems, they go together. And as I said, I will focus on the problem number two, innumeracy. That's the thing that's much more easier to be dealt. And institutions like the Harding Center for Risk Literacy in Berlin and the new Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication, our sister institute, which I'm really glad that this happened, will try to do their best to change the situation. So what I will do with you today is to uh, talk about four kinds of tools that help doctors and patients to understand risk. And the first one is the most simple one. It is the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. Absolute risks are typically clear and transparent. Relative risks mislead many people and create immense anxiety 
or undue hopes. Let me begin with an example. <coughs> the UK has many beautiful traditions. The Queen, the Corns, the Tea, but also the contraceptive pill scare. The most important of these scares uh, went this way. The US Committee for Safety on Medicines uh, called in an emergency press conference to report about a study that has shown that women who take the pill of the third generation increase their risk of getting a thrombosis by 100%. So, twofold. That couldn't be more than 100%. Isn't that certain? Many women in the UK believe that stopped in panic taking the pill, which led to unnecessary pregnancies and abortions. How much is 100%? The study had shown that out of every 7,000 British women who took the pill of the previous generation, one got a thrombosis, which increased to two out of those who took the pill of the third generation. So the absolute risk increase was from one to two in every 7,000, that is one in 7,000. The relative increase was 100%. This single news created so much panic that in the following year, there were in England and Wales about 13,000 more abortions than usual. And the entire falling trend of abortion was reversed. Women lost the trust in the pill. If the news and the UK Committee on Safety of Medicines would have reported the absolute risk, probably no single woman would have panicked and the abortions wouldn't have happened. The only ones who got, who had a profit from that were the journalists who got the study on the front page of the newspapers. And here, the Sunday Times. The title, Kiss of Death. Is the pill doomed? So here we have a simple uh, distinction. Every risk, increase or decrease, can be reported as an absolute risk, that is clear, transparent, or a relative risk, that is frightened, in the case of a risk increase. In our studies, about a third of physicians do not understand in their own field the difference between a relative and absolute risk. Two thirds do. But this is something really simple. Uh, let me <coughs> use the same principle now for the effect of cancer screening. At the Harding Center for Risk Literacy, we design so-called fact boxes. A fact box is a readable, understandable, simple summary of the benefits and harms of a treatment, of a drug, or a screening. What you see here is uh, the summary of a so-called Cochrane report that has analyzed all available randomized trials and the fact box doesn't use the relative numbers or odds ratios or likelihood ratios that confuse <coughs> ordinary people, including physicians, and also, as we have seen last week, yeah, lawyers and judges in the court, but plain absolute numbers. So these hundred thousands of participants that have been studied are broken down to here, 1,000 women who did not go screening and 1,000 who did go screening. And then the question is, what happened 10 years later? What are the benefits? And there are two kinds of benefits, namely breast cancer mortality and total mortality. So the breast cancer mortality results are roughly out of every 1,000 women age 50 or so, who do not participate in screening, 10 years later, five died with diagnosis breast cancer. 
And among those who went, it's four. So from five to four is one in thousand. That's the absolute risk. Now, if you want to get women into a screening without informing them, so if you want to nudge them, what do you do? You don't report the absolute risk, but the relative risk, which is 20%. And uh, that has been happening for a long time in many countries, and often it's rounded up hmm, to even more. You will see in a minute a day. Yeah? Yes, please? May one ask what are the actual numbers on which these figures are based? The numbers of patients? They are on the order of 500,000. 500,000? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the 5 to 4 is fairly well established. Yeah. There is always an uncertainty yeah. whether it's in the order of 1 in 1,000. Uh, some of the Cochrane reports think it's only half. As a 0.5 in 1,000, I also think it's 1.5, but that is not so important. This uncertainty will be there. Hmm? And you will see in a minute that what people believe is orders of magnitudes away. Hmm? The second information is the total cancer mortality. Why is this important? It is important because uh, it's not always uh, possible to determine the actual cause of death. And for instance, if people have multiple cancers, you do not really know from what a diet. Huh? And the interesting figure here is that the total cancer mortality is 21 out of 1,000 in the screening group and 21 out of 1,000 in the non-screening group. So we do have no evidence today that mammography screening saves a life. We have evidence that one woman uh, fewer dies uh, <coughs> with the diagnosis, breast cancer, but one more in the screening group with another diagnosis. What the reasons exactly are, they can include the radiation doses they get from treatment and also from diagnosis. They can include uh, many other factors. And harms. It's important uh, to focus on the harms because they um, uh <coughs> will hit many more people. And there are two kinds of major harms. First, women who do not have breast cancer, and there are false positives, and biopsies, and also the anxiety. And that is hard to estimate. It will be between 50 and 200 in uh, every 1,000 within 10 years. So it's very likely. And second, the second harm is for women who do not uh, who, who, who have breast cancer, but a, a non-progressive version of breast cancer that is so slow that they wouldn't need, uh, they wouldn't even notice it during their lives. And mammography may detect it, and they get unnecessary treatments. And they only have harms, like unnecessary lumpectomy. <coughs> Among those uh, breast cancer survivors is an unknown number of women who would have better would have been in better shape if I wouldn't have gone to mammography. Hmm? Because if it's a non-progressive kind of cancer, hmm, they would have lived anyway. Now they only have to bear the consequences <coughs> of a lumpectomy or radiation doses and chemotherapy or other things. So this is already a tool <coughs> for helping people. Yes? Yes. What is the uncertainty of this number five and four? Because if yeah. you are very precise uh, yeah. on the absolute number of women uh, in a country, it can yeah. be important because it means uh, we'll, we'll save a thousand women. Yeah. There is the uncertainty is, as I said before, in, so the lowest estimates, the Cochrane estimate, estimates about uh, not one, but 0 0.5 hmm, in thousand. Yeah? There are other studies which think it's more <laughs> in the order of two in every thousand. Hmm? And that depends on the so-called quality of the studies. Hmm? The importance about these fact boxes is not have now a list hmm, of all existing randomized trials hmm, and with every estimates, but that people get an, a good estimate and that best estimate is about uh, one in thousand. And you can have a confidence interval on that. Huh? But that is, uh, and we put on 
numbers if the variable is really high, you know, like uh, intervals like 50 to 200. I'll show you now how uh, pamphlets in the UK uh, have informed uh, women or do inform them still. So keep in mind, the information that women get is mostly on breast cancer mortality and almost never on total cancer mortality. Hmm? And you can see why, because that would decrease the participation rates. And women could think, oh, maybe that's not so good. Hmm? So here is uh, the Welsh NH leaflet breast screening who reports that breast screening has been shown to reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer by around 35%. That's the 20% rounded up to 35%. The New Zealand Breast Cancer Foundation reports screening mammograms reduce the chance of dying from breast cancer by approximately 33%. Also rounded up. Hmm? The uh, NHS leaflet for England has since a number of years now stopped reporting relative risk, but reports absolute risks. But as you can see, they do not report the results of the randomized trials. They make the number looking better. So one out of 200 as opposed to one out of 1,000. There's no evidence in the randomized trials for this number one out of 200 even that the randomized trials vary considerably. Uh, in Germany, we had the same thing. And until this year, the report, the same development. Huh? Uh, first, relative risks. Hmm? Then, after a uh, huge of protests by us and others, finally, they moved to absolute risk. But then there was a compromise. Hmm? You don't want to give the real numbers, but you have to make a compromise. Someone made a model a calculation and came up with one in 200 hmm? and disregarded the evidence. Uh, now we have changed that. And the new pamphlets in Germany report now what they say between one and two out of every thousand. Hmm? So that's in the, in, in the order, given the uncertainty about all of these numbers. Hmm? The NHS is not yet as far. As a consequence of the long reports about 35%, uh, 30% or even 20%, the general public is misinformed about the benefit of cancer screening. Uh, we have done the first. We wanted to find out what do people all over Europe believe <laughs> in the benefits of so women of mammography screening. We also did this for men with prostate uh, sc uh, cancer screening. I will not report about the latter, but only on the first one. I'll show you the results just for Germany and for the US, for, sorry, for the UK. You see here the German data. And so we asked them about the one in thousand number. And they had the response categories 0, 1, or 10. So we didn't want to test between 1, 2, or 3 or so. Uh, 50, 100, 200, or I have no idea what that is. No? And what you see here is that the best answer, which is 1 out of 1,000, is basically unknown to the general public. Just if they would randomly choose, they would get better <laughs> response rates. No? And the um, Breast cancer screening with mammography is the topic that uh, may be one of the most discussed topics in health in Germany. And it's just unbelievable how badly the public is informed. And you can see the 200, so the 20 percent, that's, uh, yeah. so on average, the, this is, um, the the uh, benefit is esti overestimated by an order or two orders of magnitude. Now I'll show you the results for the UK. We had a representative study in each of these countries. So about a thousand people. What do you think? Are British women better informed than German women? Who thinks? No? Here is the result. See? 
They are 100 percent better. <laughs> yeah. Even more than 100 percent. But you see the big thi this is the effect of the relative risk, particularly strong in Britain. <coughs> so that's the, the 20 percent or 30 percent. And, and so th this is uh, a quarter of the British population thinks it's like 200 out of 1,000. Yeah. We had nine countries in Europe. And I have a question for you. In which country are the women, uh, ha do the women have the best estimates for the benefit of mammography screening? I name you the nine countries. And you can think about it. You saw two. Hmm? Uh, Germany, the UK, that's all big countries. France, Italy, Spain, Poland, hmm? uh, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, and the Russian and the European part of Russia. What do you think? Italy. Hmm? Italy. Okay. I'll go Austria. Poland. Austria. <laughs> Poland. Netherlands. Netherlands. Netherlands is most people who know something about health would say Netherlands, huh? because they have an unusual health system. But no, <laughs> <laughs> misinformation is equally bad there. Spain. Can you repeat? Russia, I imagine. Right. Mm. Russia. And by far. <coughs> but why? Sure. Yeah. Not because <laughs> the Russian women get more information than the British. They get less misleading information. And what you see here is all the nine countries, a realistic estimate is something below yeah, an order of magnitude too high. Huh? And overestimated, that's the majority. German women are equally misinformed like the French. The, as you see, the British are, as we saw before, 100% huh, better. <laughs> you uh, scale up the 2% to 4% on the other way. And uh, so it goes. Hmm? So we have a situation of uh, collective Miss beliefs and unrealistic hopes about cancer screening. We've done the same for men and PSA tests. The results are almost identical. The Russian men give the best estimates. Again, not because they get more information, but less information. So the same trick is used in the US in direct-to-consumer advertising. This is one of the reasons why I personally do not think that direct-to-consumer advertising is <coughs> does anything good for healthcare. Because there's an incentive for companies to mislead the consumers directly. And it exists only in the US and New Zealand. So that is Libitor. The ad says Libitor cuts the risk by nearly half. So by nearly 50%. What does that mean? So you might think that out of 100 men who take Libita, so this is for men who already are in a condition like already have heart, have had a heart attack hmm, only. Yeah? So out of 100 men, the life of 50 is saved, isn't it? Out of men with type 2 diabetes and one risk factor? Yeah, hmm? so in that group, it's only, they're clear about the, the, the restricted group, not for the general public. So what does a 50% reduction mean? And many people think, oh, it's 50 out of every 100 men whose life is saved. They confuse a relative risk with an absolute risk. And if you look up the, uh, the original study, you find the reduction is actually from 2.8 out of every 100 to 1.5 out of every 100. And that's the 48%. So 48% translate in roughly one percentage point. And uh, many doctors, and even more uh, people in the general public, um, think that the relative risk is yeah, uh, the absolute risk. So the World's, Org World's Health Organization uh, warned us Last November, you may remember, a year ago, 
that for every 50 grams of sausage you eat daily, you increase your risk of getting colon cancer by 18%. Many of my friends, including academic friends, stopped eating sausages. I'm Bavarian. That is a real hard thing. <laughs> <laughs> Believing that that means that out of every 100 people who eat a daily uh, serve of processed meat or sausages, 18 will get colon cancer. No. <coughs> it's again a relative risk. If you look the data up, you'll find that um, in the US, so uh, the lifelong chance to get colon cancer, not to die from it, just to get it, huh? is about 5%. So out of every 100, five can expect to get colon cancer, mostly late in their life. Mm -hmm. And that increases to almost 6%. And that's the 18% increase. So if it would increase fully to 6, it would be 20%. So why does the World Health Organization inform us in relative risk and the, the probable answer is to raise attention and anxiety and to raise funding for cancer research. And that shouldn't be the role of the World Health Organization. They should be honest and report people in transparent ways. Or the other way, would we should finally uh, teach everyone to understand that simple trick and to complain. There is a variant. Um, you might say, this is business. And business is out to create beautiful impressions of the product. To my own um, surprise, I learned that uh, the misleading, the use of misleading statistics does not start in business or in journalism. It starts in the very top medical journals. And uh, I give you data for another trick that's related. You do a study on a, um, on a drug and report the benefits and the harms. Assume that your drug decreases uh, deaths from um, heart disease from in a certain population from 2 out of every 100 to 1 out of 100. But it increases deaths from colon cancer from 1 out of every 100 to 2 out of every 100. So you have an equal effect. How do you report that? Now, if you use what I call a mismatched framing, so you report the benefit in the abstract of the journal as a 50% reduction of heart disease death. <laughs> and later, somewhere hidden in the end of this article, you report that there are also side effects, but they're small. They're just one in every hundred. So one percent. <laughs> See that? You can put that into supplementary information. <laughs> <laughs> yes, even better. So, they figured it out. so now, I have a question for you. How often does this happen in the top medical journals? Every single article? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's not as bad, but according to the study, in, every one, in one out of every three articles, hmm, who both report benefits and harms. And that's in the BMJ, the JAMA, and the Lancet. So journal editors should not tolerate misleading statistics. They still do. And that's a very easy trick, the relative risk, uh, that you could easily see through. But we have not managed to put this on a hold. And there's a simple reason. Because in the US, about two out of every three studies published in the top journals are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. For the BMJ, it's about one out of every three. And that means there's pressure on the authors to use, yeah, to speak double tongue and use all kinds of tricks to present their results as 
being much better than they actually are. So that was the first part. The second part is mortality rates versus five-year survival rates. A second confusion. Again, mortality rates are clear, five-year survival rates misleading. And this is now about cancer screening. You may remember Rudy Giuliani. When he was still running for president, he um, gave an interview and said, I had prostate cancer five, six years ago, and my chances of surviving it in the US is 82%. Chances of surviving in England is only 44% under socialized medicine. That's what you have. That's a bad word for him and for the next administration too. But still, 82 is more than 44. And if you're a man, you'd better move to New York than to York. Rudy Giuliani misled the public with another misleading statistic and maybe himself. At the same time, the mortality rates in England and in the US concerning prostate cancer were basically the same. How can it be that mortality rates are the same of prostate cancer, but survival rates are almost double in the US? Now there are two reasons. And actually, the changes in survival rates or differences here over all solid cancers are correlated with differences in mortality rates by 0.0. So survival rates don't tell us anything about living longer or life safe. So why is this? There are two reasons. The first time is called the first is called lead time bias. So here are two group of men, all of them have get invasive prostate cancer and die at age 70. The top group doesn't participate in screening. That may be the British. And the, uh, this group participates in screening, could be the same group, or maybe here, the Americans. They are more pushed by the doctors and also by their well-meaning wives. So cancer starts. It is detected late because they don't go screening, say at age 67, they die at age 70. What is the five-year survival rate? Zero. Now the same group goes screening, cancer starts, it's early detected, say at age 60, they die at age 70. What is the five-year survival rate now? 100%. So it doesn't tell you anything about living longer. But this is just an example. That's an example. Because it, it looks like treatment has no effect. Yeah. And remember, I gave you for <coughs> the general uh, statistic that the correlation between differences in survival rate and difference in mortality is zero. This is just an example of what I'm saying. Hmm? So that's the first uh, reason it's called lead time bias. It's not difficult to understand. The second one is overdiagnosis. Same situation. A group of men who does not participate in PSA tests. Hmm? And five years later, they all have progressive prostate cancer. Five years later, 440 are alive, the others are dead. The five-year survival rate is 44%. Now, men who go screening. Screening detects not only deadly prostate cancers, but also so-called non-progressive prostate cancers, and there are more of them than the deadly ones. So most men who have cancer, prostate cancer, die with the cancer, not from the cancer. So just to give you an idea, if you're lucky as a man to, yeah, to live a long life, almost certainly you will get some form of prostate cancer. Estimates are that among 80-year-olds, 80% 80 have prostate cancer, but only 3% die. That's something normal. You mean die from the cancer? From, from the cancer. Prostate. That's American <laughs> statistics. <yeah? laughs> okay. And uh, so the point here is, assume it's 2000. Just make it simple. Uh, they, per definition, they don't die, but they are diagnosed. So they enter the numerator and the denominator of the five-year survival statistics. <coughs> and then you get 
Rudy Giuliani's wonderful figure out of that. So overdiagnosis is another reason why the five-year survival rates are blown up, and the other reason was the uh, yeah that you saw before. Now the question is, do doctors understand five-year survival rates, or do they confuse them with mortality rates in screening? Uh, the Harding Center in Berlin did the first study ever with doctors, one in Germany, one in the US. Uh, what do you think? The German sample is a, is a, uh, a convenient sample. The American sample is a representative sample. What do you think? I'll show you first the Germans. What proportion of doctors are misled when you give them the same information that you just saw about Rudy Giuliani, about survival rates differences, and then you give them the same information in mortality rates? The differences are really small. Hmm? What proportion of doctors understand the difference? 100%? Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. But that should be something that every medical education should try. I'll show you the, rate, the result. When the same information, that the information was taken from one of the large screening trials, where the differences were given in survival rates, just as Rudy Giuliani did, 97% of the doctors judged the screening as highly effective and wanted to recommend it to their patients. The same information given in mortality rates, only 5%. So you can uh, influence the doctors hmm, in any direction, at least most of them, hmm, you want to go. <coughs> and they have no training in understanding such easy distinction. When we ask them, uh, do you know what the lead time bias is? Two out of 65 knew. Mm. Overdiagnosis, zero. Are American doctors better trained? What do you think? No? No, but maybe more sure of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> as long as patients don't ask questions and don't understand it, the game goes on. So here's the result for a representative study of over 400 primary care physicians. The similar results, when the information was given in survival rates, most of them judged mortality benefit as large, although it doesn't tell you anything about that. If it's mortality rates, then 28 is low. So similar results. And then we, in addition, ask which proves that the cancer screening saves lives. Now, Screen-detected cancers have a better five-year survival rate, which doesn't prove anything, as you have seen before, but 76% think yes. The correct answer is the mortality rate question, and it's not much different. And we were surprised about the answer to number two, and it's almost unbelievable. So more cancers are detected in screen population. We put that in as a kind of filler question, so the easy one. So of course, any test that is of any use will detect more cancers. That doesn't mean that lives are saved huh? if the treatment doesn't work, huh? for instance. Huh? But almost half of them believe that too. You see the failure of medical schools in the US. I and mean, before you saw that in Germany. Now given that most doctors and patients do not understand the difference between five years of vital rate and, and mortality rates in cancer screening, um, any medical commercial provider can mislead people very easily. I'll show you a few examples. MD Anderson, this is an ad from MD Anderson, one of the most respected American cancer centers. And they, in this ad they show that their five-year survival rates really increased impressively compared to the national rates which somehow hang on on the same level. This is prostate cancer screening. Only if you look at the description here, you find out that this is the survival rate, but this is not the survival rate. It's the mortality rate, which is uncorrelated with the survival rate. But you see the trick? But most doctors don't notice that. And in the text, they, uh, 
say that more effective radiation therapy and surgery have contributed to the overall increase in longevity. Huh? That's it. Yeah. There is no increase in longevity, period. It's just a statistical trick. Um, that creates both confusion and enthusiasm about PSA tests. Not only men are misled by this trick, women too. A Susan G. Komen is the largest cancer, uh, breast cancer organization in the US, and as far as I know, the inventor of the pink ribbon policy. So give women not information, but pink ribbons and teddy bears, and they're happy. And that's an unusual ad by Susan Komen because it actually has numbers. Uh, in the US, in the good old years, one didn't give numbers to women because women were not supposed to get numbers and uh, claims were made that women fear numbers. They don't want to see numbers. Hmm? They just want to be told. In the 1980s, there was still a poster by the American um, uh, American uh, Cancer Association which on mammography which said if you you haven't had a mammogram you need more than your breasts investigated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is no longer politically correct today and now it's done with numbers with trick and if you look closely you see here the uh, five year survival trick it says um, get screened now that's the usual way you talk to women <laughs> But it's an actual number. The five-year survival rate for breast cancer when caught early is 98%. We're not 23. Rudy Giuliani at work. Yeah? <laughs> now, you, here's the World Health <coughs> Organization. The recent 2014 position paper on mammography screening. And this is the executive <coughs> summary. What do you see here? Five-year survival rates. No mortality rate. And you know the difference is one in thousand, but it becomes here, uh, if you are not going, five year survival rates are between 10 and 40%, and if you're going, then it sits 80%, twice as much. Mm. So, uh, yeah, uh, let me come to my third point, and here is number three of a uh, pair of statistics, natural frequencies help to understand now the results of tests, while conditional probabilities confuse. I have trained about a thousand doctors in their continuing medical education myself, and I give you an example about 160 gynecologists, age in the 40s and their 50s, and they have to do this in order to get their license renewed, their points. And I started out this session with a problem that every gynecologist should know about. That's mammography screening. So, a woman who went screening got a positive result, a suspicious result, and ask you as a doctor, what does that mean? Do I have breast cancer or what's the chance? Is it 99%, 90 50 10 1 Please tell me that I know how I should sleep until I get the biopsy a week later. So every gynecologist should know the answer. You will see in a minute that they don't know it. Only few knows. And uh, the reason is because they are trained on Bayes rule, that's a Bayesian inference, like in court, but in Bayes rule with conditional probabilities. And conditional probabilities confuse most people. The alternative are natural frequencies, a technique we have developed and tested. I'll first give you the conditional probabilities. Now you are now this 150 or so gynecologist. And I will confuse you now with conditional probabilities, or try my do my best there, yeah, because this is a, a so too many IQ points here in the audience. Yeah. But maybe one or other hmm, hmm, it will work. <laughs> are you ready? Okay. You get first the information and conditional probability <coughs> that you need in order to answer this woman's question. And remember, it's screening, you know nothing else about her. So, the prevalence of breast cancer 
in this population being screened is 1%. So if a woman, so 1% of the women have breast cancer. Second, if a woman has breast cancer, the probability that she will test positive is 90%. Third, if a woman does not have breast cancer, the probability that she nevertheless tests positive is 9%. So you have a prevalence or base rate of 1%, a sensitivity of 90%, and a false positive rate of 9%. What do you tell this woman? What's the chance that she really has breast cancer, given the positive result? If your mind is now clouded, that's what I would like to generate. And I'll show you first what gynecologists think the <coughs> answer is. So, I gave the gynecologist four response uh, types uh, as far spread apart as possible because we are not doing little mathematics. So the answer is a 1% chance that she actually has cancer or a Bayesian posterior probability if you want. 10%, 81%, and 90%. Here's the result. Every point is a gynecologist. So 47% thinks the answer is 90%. So that is basically, uh, could be interpreted as a death sentence. Others think it's 81%, some think it's 10%, and another fifth roughly think it's 1%. Whatever. The best answer is, you see here, how good medical education is. So you can get anything out of a doctor. Now, at this point, um, yeah. possibly make a little comment here. Yeah. If you are one particular woman who gets a positive result from the mammogram, she can say to herself, it is 10 times more likely that the mammogram is a false positive than that I have cancer. Yeah, that's correct. 10% versus 1%. Yeah. 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 So I'll show you now that you can get at that by using natural frequencies. Natural frequencies is another representation, just like it's to, to conditional probabilities similar like absolute risk to relative risk. And you start not with one woman, but with a certain number. To make it simple, think about 100 women. Now we translate these figures. We expect that out of every 100, one has breast cancer and that she likely tests positive. That's the 90%. Out of the 99 who don't have breast cancer, we expect another nine to test positive. So we have 10 who test positive in total. How many of them? Do we expect to have breast cancer? So it's one out of ten, as you said. So the point is, by changing the representation, it's much easier to see through. And I will explain in a minute why we see through. First, I'll show you the same gynecologist at the end of a 90-minute session where I explained to them the translation of conditional probabilities into natural frequencies using other problems. I tested them on the mammography, mammography uh, problem again, giving them conditional probabilities as before. And now the majority was able to translate that and to understand that the best answer is 10 out of 100 or 1 out of 10. So 87% now saw through. There are a few hopeless cases up there, but that's in 90 minutes, that's all you can do. <coughs> the, now. Um, this is not just an empirical result, but there is a rationale behind them. Why natural frequencies facilitate and others do not. So that's the natural frequency representation. Now I took a thousand to make it more precise. Ten of cancer, nine positive, one negative, and they corresponding on the other side. And that's the probability uh, representation. The point is that the calculations, the Bayesian calculations, that you need to do on conditional probability is that formula. And if you were confused, that's why you were confused. The representation in natural frequency does part of the computation. And that's the difference. So uh, basically, the, um, 
the, the multiplications here, uh, you don't have to do them because there's no normalization. These numbers down here add up to the 1,000 women. These numbers down here don't add up to 1 because there's normalization. And that's why the fa facilitation is there. And you can make from that prediction that if you have, instead of conditional probabilities, relative frequencies, it doesn't help because it has the same type of Bayesian complicated base. So here's a way how people can be Bayesian uh, in a natural way, rather than doing this complicated formula. Yes. Something which uh, I don't. The last in the last row here, conditional probabilities. Yeah. You should write the point nine. You should write the point to o o nine, then point to o o one, and the same, and the relative ratio remains, because what you are doing on the left side is to multiply. The number you have 10, and then you take 10 per 9 percent of 10, which is 9, and then yeah. 1 percent of 10, which is 1. Yeah. Here you have a point 0.01, then you have to take 90 percent of that, which will be 0 0.009, and so on. And then the the math is okay. But that's not how the information is given, because they say 90 percent of people with cancer are correctly yeah. detected. It's it's written the way the information is given. Oh. So the, uh, I, I gave you the, the, uh, the representation first in conditional probabilities, and that's over here. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, it's an equivalent uh, <laughs> representation. It just helps people to see through. And you may uh, re remember, if you're a psychologist or behavioral economist, that the claim is that people are bad Bayesians, mm -hmm. and that there's little hope to do anything about that. If you read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, you will read that claim. He knows our research about natural frequencies, and he knows that it's wrong what he's saying, but he says it. The book should be entitled Confirmation Bias, or My <laughs> Confirmation Bias. <laughs> and it goes with almost everything in this book, just one here. And we have done studies showing that already fourth graders can do Bayesian reasoning if you use problems that have only two-digit problems, hmm? they have not even have ratios. If you add icons, <laughs> and what do you see here? So th these are not mammography, uh, but more Harry Potter problems. Mm -hmm. And the fourth graders, with the help of icons, 60% can solve these Bayesian problems without uh, uh, over 40%, and even a few second graders can do that. So that's something very natural that uh, can be helped, uh, and it's not something that the uh, human mind is not designed. So the last thing, I think we are running out of time, but i just show you two fact boxes and end with that. You've seen one fact box for mammography screening, and that's an important tool. Uh, the, um, this is prostate cancer fact box now without numbers for people who don't like numbers. In our, my experience, most doctors don't like numbers. They want to see that one. Hmm? And you can see it's again four categories. Yeah? So uh, people dying from prostate cancer, that's the same number here, eight here, eight there. Hmm? And people dying <coughs> total, that's the same number here. There are a few black ones which uh, haven't been there yesterday. I don't know what that means. <laughs> 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 and Strangely, yeah? good, forget them. Uh, the yellow ones are the happy ones that survive, and the only difference is among those who go screening, and it's the same kind of difference, men who do have non-progressive prostate cancer, it's detected and treated. They have only harms. And men who do not have prostate cancer, that's what they like ones, and they are just um, get unnecessary uh, biopsies, which is a much... So you're really saying the treatment has no effect? In uh, screening, screening has no effect. Catch it early, but then you can't help the people to live longer or... So prostate screening, are we talking about screening, not about If you treatment. screen, you do catch it earlier. That's clear from your very If you catch it early by screening, there's no evidence it. that a life is being saved. So why isn't that the thing that everybody's being told? No, the NHS, the NHS does not recommend prostate cancer screening. No uh, 
the uh, respectable society in the world recommends PSA screening that because of the data. Of course, many doctors recommend it to you, and why? Because of the SIC problem. Self-defense, they want to defend you, yes. Uh, conflicts of interest, they make money with that, yeah? or they just don't know. <coughs> so, uh, and that helps you to see through. Here is my last example of a uh, fact box, now a different format. That's uh, on um, yeah. That's on tablets, and you can have them on your uh, on your iPhone. And we do this with the largest German health insurer, the uh, AOK. And this is about ovarian cancer screening. And uh, I hope you can see that uh, this is the um, the the mortality, the ovarian cancer mortality out of thousand who participate and don't participate. It's the same. Again, has no positive effect, but it hurts many women. How can an ultrasound hurt women? It's an ultrasound plus tumor marker. So, uh, roughly out of every thousand, a hundred eventually get a positive result. And given that you can't do a biopsy on ovarians, the only thing you can do is to take it out and find out whether it there is something or not. And that happens to about 31 out of every 100 healthy women. And so they lose their ovarians and uh, will suffer from that the rest of your life. Doing ovarian cancer screening. It's not 31 out of 100 women. Of, of these exactly 31 of. Of 100 women who've received a positive result on the test. Yes. Hmm? And uh, five of them are, yeah, have really serious uh, conditions. So this type of screening in Germany, and in I think in uh, no country, it's funded by the health insurance, except private health insurance. They may want to get more customers. But it's offered by gynecologists. They get about 35 euros for it. <laughs> and we have estimated what the consequences are. In 2014, and these are rough estimates, very hard to get the, the numbers. About uh, 3 million German women were offered an ultrasound. 2 million took it. Consequences, they had to pay from their own pocket. They paid about 35 million euro from their own pockets. And an estimated 35,000 of these women, got healthy women, got their ovarians taken out. And you can't take them in again. This borders on crime, what's happening here. And the health insurers then pay uh, <coughs> hundreds of millions for dealing with the rest. So this is what the Harding Center has done. Uh, so we have, um, I think we were successful uh, to get misleading statistics out of almost all cancer screening pamphlets in Germany over the last 10 years. Uh, fact boxes are now in German, in Swiss, and Austrian health insurance. And we've trained quite a number of doctors, and natural frequencies are now part of evidence-based medicine. So let me sum up, let me um, end this talk. Uh, the problem I've addressed is the innumeracy among doctors and patients. We can do many things about that. We have to revolutionize the medical departments. They need to realize that you d just with more big data or more technology, you don't get anywhere if people don't understand what the outcomes are. We need to revolutionize continuing med medical education. And we need to provide tools that can be online tools, can be other tools that everyone has access to so that people can think along. We also need to change patients. That patients are willing to take over responsibility for their own health and the health of their children. Facing the problem that many doctors don't know the evidence, have, may have conflicting evidence, and practice defensive medicine. So I hope that gave you a kind of awareness. And also I hope that uh, you can contribute 
to making the system a better system, so in making the 21st century a century for the patient, not for the industry. Thank you very much. Yes. Have you got any information on the DNA uh, screening? Something like that. Now there are ways to analyze DNA and understand if you have something. Have you done some studies or somebody has done studies? On screening? Yes, on, based on DNA analysis. Yeah. Just to, to see if, there are, if you can encounter disease in, and so on. So the on cancer screening? In general, in general, with uh, DNA, the people say that you can get in advance some uh, you know, some hints that you can get a disease, and then possibly. Okay, as the you have shown that with prostate it doesn't work. If the uh, skin is better, you have a better quality of life until you die. This is the, the yeah. <coughs> there are many claims being made, hmm? and most of these claims are unclear whether they actually are based on evidence or on commercial uh, interests. Huh? So. We have the problem that, for instance, uh, pregnant women are offered more and more uh, prenatal tests. So not just Down syndrome, but more and more and more, ever rare uh, diseases. And then, at the same time, studies show that uh, most doctors don't even understand what a, a positive result in a Down syndrome test is. So how will they deal? with diseases which are less frequent and where then at the end the so-called Bayesian posterior probability or as the medical people say the positive predictive value is mini minimal and that may lead yeah, if the people if people stay as uneducated to more abortions in situations yeah, where the uh, baby is totally yeah, healthy so in general it is uh, I think the, the real way out of the misery that we have, huh, the waste of money in healthcare, estimates are that 85% of all funded studies are useless, in the sense that they are not serving the patient, but only other interests, huh, is more critically thinking patients and doctors. Huh. Yeah. I agree with your general points, of course. And, uh, I should say my doctor and I had a discussion. We stopped the TSA test. Yeah. <laughs> but I did want to mention, when you talked about the overdiagnosis problem with Rudy and Judy, it seemed to me that, the, in the, as far as I know, with prostate cancer, there's a Gleason score. Yeah. <laughs> and with other, and that kind of tells you whether you're in the, the high risk or the low risk category. Yes. Uh, and similarly, other, other uh, Cancers have stages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that part of the problem is, I don't want to use this, this is a naughty word, but you the condition, <laughs> or you have to compare like a like. I would say stratify your comparison. And yeah. If they stratified the comparison, you wouldn't have had that problem. Okay. So uh, let, let me get to prostate cancer screening, PSA screening. Let me first say there's a difference between using PSA for screening or follow up after an operation. There's no, no question about that. Huh? The question is about screening. Mm -hmm. And the, um, there is a huge controversy uh, out there, and <coughs> it's mainly a commercially driven controversy. Mm -hmm. I showed you the, the, the summary of all available uh, yeah, randomized trials. And uh, let me just put another source to that. Um, Richard Abling is the man who discovered PSA. He's an outspoken critic of routine PSA testing. Yeah. And he said uh, in, his, in his book, I had never dreamed that my discovery 40 years ago would end up in such a profit-driven health disaster for men. Mm. So all these incontinent, impotent men out there who, who then believe it saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, I, I don't think I made my, my comment yeah. here. What I'm saying is that if you put the overdiagnosis what I'm saying is that you, the group that did not have the progressive, progressive cancers almost surely had a very low Gleason score. So they should not be combined. The problem was that, that they were pooled into this, your summary statistics. If you said, let's look at this group, 
So it would only compare that high risk group to the other high risk group. Because it's not proper to yeah. mm -hmm. to lump the low risk group into the high risk group when you do the statistics. Yeah. That's quite important. But look, uh, cancer screening is for asymptomatic patients. So it's not for high risk. It's for everyone. That's, that's the point. If you have a symptom, uh, this is no longer screening. It's a different situation. And, the, and this example is about screening. Where we have the best evidence, it's much easier to, to find lots of data. <coughs> if, you, private, I don't think if you do have prostate cancer, if that's your state, yeah? if you do have prostate cancer, uh, studies indicate that treatment may be slightly better in terms of benefits than watchful waiting. Yeah? But also you have all the harms of the treatment. And you always need to realize that everything that's praising uh, uh, that is uh, claimed to have benefit or has benefit in medicine also has some kind of harm. And that's then where I think informed judgment is, is important. And with a fact box, you start to get the information that you cannot make up your own mind. Is that an answer? Well, maybe we can talk later. Okay. I had a question. Oh, sure. uh, yeah, I was just wondering when you have multiple indicators, like yeah. when you go to your doctor and they give, you know, do you smoke, and they give you different kind of like risk factor information. Do you have kind of ways of um, have you looked at how people deal with this kind of multiple bits of information where it might not be quite so easy to do a tree or yeah. present information? I mean, because your I think one of your arguments is that. If you have like a tree-like representation yeah. with natural frequencies, you can kind of work it yeah. out quite, quite easily yeah. with education. But what happens when you have, let's say, multiple holistic yeah. factors? And I'm wondering whether you've looked at that. Yeah, uh, I do have looked at that, but not talked about this today. Yeah, yeah. This is the difference between a Bayesian approach, hmm, which gets into problems if you have not one test but many, many tests. The more tests, there are two problems. One is the lesser one that's usually talked about is computational complexity. At some point, it's, you can't calculate it anymore, but we can calculate very far. Hmm? The real problem is estimation. That if you have 10 tests, hmm, you have a tree with 1,024 uh, endpoints, hmm? and you need to estimate each of these conditional probabilities. Hmm? And there's often nothing in the cells. So in that situation, you're better to study uh, or to turn into heuristics. And a fast and frugal trees are a, it's like part of a Bayesian tree. And they can do, deal much better with the estimation problem because they have much fewer to estimate. But that, that was not the talk today. But I'll give in, uh, I think, next week in, uh, in your university talk, I will talk about these, these things. Yeah. But I do have a few flyers out there for books you can read about the fast and frugal tree and <laughs> exactly that problem. Yeah. Well, you, you have once again mentioned heuristics, which you yeah. mentioned at the start of your talk, and that's the point I was going to, as it were, mention or emphasize. Because I have lived long enough to remember visiting doctors or hospitals 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the approach of the doctor to the patient was heuristic. Um, and indeed, very often a diagnosis would be generated simply by looking at you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's what you've got. And usually they were right. Nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, recent experience is that if you have some problem, you describe it to the doctor, they then start entering symptoms onto the computer. Or we can ask them to, to investigate other matters, and you can spend an hour yeah. while they yeah. do all this, yeah. and you may well end up getting sent to hospital yeah. to have a whole day of this operation mm -hmm. carried out, yeah. simply for the sake of diagnosis, <coughs> which may not be correct. Yeah. And it is this transfer, if you like, of call it heuristic knowledge to formal uh, yeah. as it were, computer-based mm -hmm. information. I won't necessarily call it knowledge. 
uh, which seems to me to be something of a, a problem. The fact that you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it. Yeah, <coughs> right. Uh, the, the, um, we have done, and I've not spoken about that, yeah, uh, much research on uh, what a heuristic is, how you can build models of heuristic and the situations where one can show <coughs> that they do better in predicting. There could be medical diagnosis or, uh, or I work with the Bank of England on simple heuristics <coughs> that make the world of finance safer. Hmm? And the conditions, in general, the conditions are, you mentioned one, um, an experienced doctor of the old school hmm, also had an environment that was very different. So he, he would probably, if it's he, meet you repeatedly yeah. and see today it's different, hmm, which is difficult for today's doctor who, uh, where, where this relationship has been broken in many cases. Yeah? And I'd rather look in the computer than on you. Hmm. The, there are studies about simple so-called bedside rules that are simple heuristics where you just look at one thing and if it doesn't discriminate on, on a second thing and a third thing, uh, that have been shown to be better than computer tomography or MRIs. The uh, key reason why this old wisdom is uh, no longer taught uh, is the dominance of industry and things you can sell, in my opinion. I will try to, to get it a little bit back. And we have in many situations um, uh, uh, a competition between reliance on heavy, heavy computations like big data on the one hand and, and educating doctors and patients about thinking. I can tell you many stories about that. And uh, there, is, there is certainly an over uh, reporting about the benefits of big data or personalized medicine. Mm. The, the successes are very small, mm. but the time uh, wasted there is enormous, which could be put <laughs> in all of these things that you see here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on that note, we'll thank you for the